Thanks for listening to the Mornings with Carmen LaBerge podcast, made available thanks to support from listeners just like you. Helping you wake up, remembering this is our Father's world. This is Mornings with Carmen LaBerge on Faith Radio. If we're gonna fly, we fly like eagles, arms out wide. If we're gonna fear, we fear no evil. We will rise by your power. We will go by your spirit. We are bold. If we're gonna stand, we stand as giants. If we're gonna walk, we walk as lions. Well, good morning, and no, not Carmen. She's taking a couple of days off to be with her folks. I'm Paul, filling in here on Mornings Without Carmen here on Faith Radio. So a good Monday to you, as we usually do. Let's start off in God's Word, letting God speak to us this morning through what He has already spoken. And hopefully you've noticed, as we've been doing or growing your faith verses, and then as Carmen has been doing this opening segment this month, we've been focusing on the teachings of Jesus that He delivered in what is called the Sermon on the Mount. Now, just as an aside, ever wonder why... Matthew has Jesus' teaching so wonderfully accounted for in his gospel. Well, maybe you noticed during the TV series The Chosen, if you've been watching that, Dallas Jenkins actually gave a really good glimpse into rabbinic teaching practices. Now, even before the sermon was delivered, Jesus spent a fair amount of time with Matthew about the sermon. I don't know if that actually factored in or not, but I found that interesting. But then, as the sermon is being delivered, you'll notice, number one, Matthew taking notes, but you'll also notice the other members of the Twelve, as Jesus is delivering the sermon, and it's a loud, crowd, a large crowd, and so he would say something, and they would repeat it. He would say something, they would repeat it. Kind of that uh, rabbinic way of doing things. That way, those close by, yes, they'd hear it, but it gets drilled into the apostles' minds as well. Then you saw the 12 going out to the surrounding cities, Jesus sending them out, and what were they repeating? The teachings of Jesus, largely what he had already spoken during the Sermon on the Mount. This was their corset of teachings that Jesus was, re- was proclaiming, and they are amazing teachings. Starting with the counterintuitive Beatitudes, Jesus continued to send out a set a clear vision of the ways of God's coming kingdom and how to be a faithful disciple now in this world, living out in living them out in this broken world. Teachings on how anger and wishing someone harm is a type of murder. Teachings on fidelity of heart, not just actions. Simp- making sure a simple yes and a no is all you need. Not not these elaborate you know, elaborate vows with (laughs) escape clauses, not seeking revenge, loving your enemies, about not making a show of your generosity or your piety, but doing so genuinely and, yes, not again, not making a show of it. And then what we should pray for, the Lord's Prayer, right? Well, we are familiar with these teachings in our day, because after all, we've been reading the Bible, hopefully, or even if you just heard the Lord's Prayer and the Beatitudes, because those are, those are pretty much well known. Even, even though they're familiar to us, you got to think about what the people of Jesus' day were hearing, because for them, it was groundbreaking. It was different. A lot of what Jesus targeted was against the traditions that got built up around and over the teachings of God in the Old Testament, stuff that actually undermined what God was seeking from those who were to be the citizens of his kingdom. So as we continue looking at the Sermon on the Mount, we get to the point in chapter 6 where Jesus is focusing on the issue of money. Now, we're growing your faith verse. That doesn't start until Matthew 6.25, and it starts out with the phrase, this is why I tell you. Well, if he's telling us, if he says that, obviously there's, that clues us into the fact there's something before that we should know. And for that, let's go back to what basically were our Growing Your Faith verses over the weekend on Saturday and Sunday. Let's start with, with uh, chapter 6, verse 9. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moth eat, uh, eat them and rust destroys them, or where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Okay, quickly to summarize, as, God, as people of God's coming kingdom, 
Do we treasure that? Are you wanting to be part of what God is building there? Stuff that's incorruptible. Or are, you, or are you fixated on the stuff of this world, the comforts of this world, the wealth of this world? Are you treasuring that stuff? Stuff that doesn't last anyway. It'll impact your heart. It will corrupt your heart as uh, if you do. Here's what he goes on to say. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep is that darkness? The eye is then the thing that focuses on the things you really treasure, on what you really desire. So what are you focused on? Jesus adds emphasis about the corrupting nature of the desire of the stuff of this world over the better, incorruptible, and non-corrupting treasures of God and his kingdom. But hey, you might say, ah, can I have both? I mean, I'm living in the world now. Can I have the, uh, the uh, can I desire what a lot of people can, in this world consider the goodies, you know, and also have a desire for the kingdom afterward? I want the stuff here and the stuff there. Jesus continued, no one can have two masters, for you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved by money. Trying to have split core devotions doesn't work. Something needs to be your core treasure. Is it going to be money or is it going to be God, our Heavenly Father and His coming ding- kingdom? Which brings us to our Growing Your Faith, your faith our, <laughs> growing your faith verse for today here at Faith Radio, with again, which again is Matthew 6, 25 and 26. This is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. Are, and aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Here's where Jesus really contrasts the nature of money as a core treasure and God and his kingdom as a core treasure. Something will hopefully flesh out tomorrow, but let me give you a little tease by saying this. We know experientially that money is a hard taskmaster. Maybe you and your family were hit hard back in 2008 when home values tumbled and unemployment shot up in the Great Recession here in the U.S. and actually other parts of the world. All the promises you feel you had in your home's value and your job dissolved in quick order. Did the money care for you? Did it feel sorry for your loss? You might say, of course not. Money doesn't feel anything. And you're right. That's the point. Money, and really, you can add things like fame and physical pleasure or any treasure of this world, doesn't care for you. It just is. Our Heavenly Father isn't like that stuff. He cares for His creation. He cares for you. And we'll pick up there tomorrow (laughs) as we look at the uh, Sermon on the Mount with your Growing Your Faith verses here this month here at Faith Radio. I'm Paul again, filling in for Carmen. So again, mornings without Carmen. And it wasn't too long ago I I saw a headline and it read in part, I read part of the article too. And it was regarding a proposed law in my home state. And the article argued that it was a bad law because it went against our Christian liberties. Now, this is true. It did. But I still felt uncomfortable with the overall argument of the article. Why? Because is if the law is bad, was it only bad because it went against a biblical Christian sensibilities? Or was it a bad piece of legislation because what it would implement would be bad for the citizens of the state? Would it go against how God designed nature to work? Are we missing an opportunity as Christians of engaging the world in, in a way that we see God's designs in our creation well. And that, to that end, they, they, these are things pointing people to God in his ways. Joel Carini, who blogs at The Natural Theologian, joins me in 90 seconds. Again, I'm Paul filling in for Carmen here on Faith Radio. 
Well, again, Paul filling in for Carmen, so mornings without Carmen here on Faith Radio for this Monday. Hey, something's happening to the new atheist movement. Many members are talking positively about Christianity, or at least the uh, moral teachings of it. But you also have people from that group, people like Ayan Hershey Ali, a former Muslim turned new atheist, but now a follower of Jesus. And maybe you've heard of others like historian Molly Worthen of the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, who, well, she's written some pretty critical books about evangelicals in the past, but now she's embracing Jesus. Now, did they get there by just reading Bible verses? Well, I'm sure that played into it, but I don't think that's where it started. Something about this world and its design hit them first. Joining me now here on uh, Mornings Without Carmen is Joel Carini. He uh, is a philosopher and a theolo- uh, theologian pursuing a Ph.D. at the St. Louis University, and he's also the host of a substack called The Natural Theologian. Joel, it's good to have you back here on Mornings Without Carmen, because we talked back in June? Yeah, I think it was June. Yes, Paul, great to be back. Thank you for having me. You know, what I just talked about, Joel, is something you've noticed as well as you interact with other students and such. People who were rejecting Christianity, mm-hmm. who were following a secular worldview, but now they're rethinking things. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, we've seen this over um, about a decade or so. Um, Justin Brierley, uh, the host of a British apologetic oh, show, describes Justin. it. In, there you go. In the the surprising rebirth of belief in God, how um, it, within the atheist movement, there became a divide between this kind of progressive morality that was coming in and trying to take over the atheist movement, bringing in kinds of... Uh, sensitivity first so they couldn't critique Islam anymore and and then bringing in sensitivity to uh, liberal moral issues um, that that started to to leave rationality and science behind and I think with some of that we, we've seen this vacuum of belief uh, where people don't believe in anything and what happens is not that they remain rational and scientific and not believing in anything new ideologies, rush in to fill that gap of meaning and purpose and what am I going to live for? Um, And in recent times, it's been often political and moral ideologies that take over concern for uh, people of different uh, sexual and racial minorities uh, and so on. But, you know, we've seen that, especially with say the the transgender issues uh, start to leave the scientific truth of the sexual dimorphism of the human species, mm-hmm. that people are male and female, start to leave that behind. And people, even up to J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter series, started to dissent from that, not to mention Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and the, the famous New Atheists. Mm-hmm. And along with that, you saw intellectuals like Jordan Peterson start to spell out much of what we previously would have called a Christian worldview but without starting from any Christian or biblical premises, Mm -hmm. but from uh, psychology and evolutionary theory and social sciences, um, and starting to spread a message that new atheism was empty and you you need to at least act as if God existed uh, in order to have a meaningful life, embracing responsibility. And so I've started to to see over the last decade, um, especially more recently, people who are shaped by those ideas starting to change their own worldview and way of life, not by first adopting full bore you know, Christianity, but by this new openness to thinking that Christianity is at least good or useful, or it had, you know, whatever my parents taught me, there might've been something to it, hmm. even if I don't believe it all the way. I've been meeting a lot of those people. Yeah. You've met, you said you met a lot of these younger people too, mainly young men, right? Um, a lot of young men, not not exclusively. Okay. Um, I, I think of um, uh, this isn't someone I've met, but the author Louise Perry has written about the consequences of the sexual revolution, and that's dovetailed with it. So there have been lots of concerns of women uh, as well. So it hasn't been exclusively young men. Okay. Well, oftentimes we as Christians, okay, the, 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 we need to turn the table because. You're seeing this. I've been seeing this because I'm following things like uh, Quillette and a few other mm-hmm. sites now. They they're like to talk about being heterodox thinkers. And a mm-hmm. lot of what they talk about, it's like, okay, that that goes with a 
worldview or at least an understanding of God as creator, at least that part about it, um, they're seeing – there's there's a real world, <laughs> I guess is what you're talking mm-hmm. about. So oftentimes, though, we as Christians, we, we've we kind of, because they're secular, we, we get concerned because if we're going to take into account the physical world and, and science, oh, dear, we, we ha- it, 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 science, that's going to lead to a scientific worldview and, and rationality is going to destroy faith. And you're kind of saying, wait a minute. No. Mm-hmm. Uh, talk about that. Yeah, well— to me, it feels like, you know, you're in uh, a war and the naturalist materialists have taken some ground and you're saying, uh, I will just leave that to them. So they've taken the ground of science and the natural world that God created and said, this is our territory. It points to our worldview. And the Christians often say, you can have that. We'll just stick with our little island over here of the Bible. Mm-hmm. Whereas for most of Christian history, from even the earliest apologists like Justin Martyr, the idea was that actually philosophy and nature and reflection on the world, it actually points to God. We can argue with you on your own uh, territory, on the world that we all share in common. So with, um, with evolutionary science, this has been really interesting because mm-hmm. you've seen a conflict between um, this kind of postmodern worldview where we construct reality Uh, and a a scientific worldview where there's this one aspect of the scientific worldview that I want to affirm wholeheartedly, which is what we say and think about the world is accountable to how things are. (laughs) You know, if, if I say there are 72 genders, I need to be able to go look at the world and verify that. And if it comes back that there are, there are really fundamentally two major divisions of the human species sexually and everything else is ideas in people's minds, well, then that my my words have to be accountable to that. I have to stick with that. And people are often in this secular space and and the scientists and so on, they're putting these things in terms of evolution. Mm -hmm. They'll say, instead of saying God designed the human species to have uh, two two sexes, uh, they'll say natural selection designed, or they'll try to avoid the word design (laughs) to, to make us a sexually reproducing species, you've got one sex that produces the small gametes and one that produces the large gametes. You'll hear someone like J.K. Rowling or Steven Pinker or Richard Dawkins speaking this way. There is a scientific basis for, for these things. And I think Christians ought to, not uncritically, but no. thoughtfully and critically embrace this. Because I think it's too much of a concession to say that without opening your Bible, we just couldn't know that there were two sexes. Mm-hmm. We just couldn't know what, what evidence is there, which I don't think anyone really wants to admit, but we should embrace that our, our eyes can see things. And there, there's, when we open the book of Genesis, what I think is so compelling about Genesis 1 to 3 is you read it and you say, that is indeed what I see in the world. <laughs> I see people, uh, I see this, complexity of each biological species. I see man at the pinnacle of that. I see the human species divided into male and female and marriage uniting them and procreation coming from that. And I see people broken and affected by the fall at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I I think we want to say that while there are some things the Bible teaches us that are brand new, we we wouldn't know of the uh, incarnation, birth, death, and resurrection of Christ uh, without this new witness, but that God created the world, that the world is designed, that uh, man is more than just another animal, that human beings are divided into two sexes, that that we are fallen. Even yeah. even the fall, uh, Chesterton or <laughs> Reinhold Niebuhr, I've heard it variously attributed that, yeah. that original sin is an empirical doctrine. There's all sorts of evidence all around you. Just yeah. open your eyes. Yeah. Again, we're talking with uh, Joel Carini, the natural theologian. You can find him on Substack. Um, you know, as we continue our conversation here, I, I was mentioning people like Tom Holland, the historian, mm. not the guy who played Spider-Man in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. <laughs> Although, again, Tom Holland, not a Christian, but can't ignore the positive impact of Christian teaching in the Western world and just seeing the beauty of it. And I mentioned Hershey mm-hmm. Ali, who wrestled with worldview and secularism, now comes out as a Christian. 
because she saw design, which led her to Jesus. And these, these wrestlings are not just for the handful of people. So how can we, in, as Christians, in our Christian context, look at some of these important theological arguments that, that nature has provided for us, that science has provided for us? We're going to continue talking about that in about 90 seconds as we continue here on Mornings Without Carmen here on Faith Radio. You've probably noticed by now the United States is in the process of electing its next president. And while Election Day is in November, people are voting throughout the month of October. And so how will you, as a Christian, engage in conversations about the election process and its outcome? We want to be part of that conversation with you. So we've got an election prayer guide to share with you at MyFaithRadio.com. Or you could text the word VOTE, V-O-T-E, to 877-933-2484. I mean, we all know elections matter, and there's no question the election process can produce tension and stress. But while the world is debating many things, there are many things beyond debate. So how might you bring the mind of Christ and the peace of Christ to bear on the election-related conversations this month? Join us in praying for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Join us in praying for the kingdom of God to advance in the midst of the kingdoms of this world. Join us in praying for those in positions of political power, and let us pray for one another as dual citizens. I mean, ultimately, the Holy Spirit is our guide, but it also helps to have a guide for praying. It is in that spirit and with the hope of shared prayer that I invite you to get our election guide today. You can download it at MyFaithRadio.com or just text the word VOTE, V-O-T-E, to 877-933-2484. Well, again, Paul filling in for Carmen here on Faith Radio. And, you know, most weeks I, among the things I do, I listen to a podcast of a couple ladies who are in the world of gender counseling. And that they're, they're more than just a little concerned. They're majorly concerned about what is often called gender medicine these days. And they're speaking out against it. It's unscientific nature that uh, Joel and I were just talking about. It's long-term damage and such. Now, these ladies are not followers of Jesus by any stretch. But I enjoy listening to them and their guests because, again, The majority of their guests are not Christians, but they offer insights that play into so well about what the Bible says about human sexuality. So how do we engage well with a lot of this discussion? Again, we're talking with Joel Carini, the natural theologian. That's his blog on Substack, and he's got a great article. It's from a few months back called 17 Secular Premises for a Theological Argument. Now, Joel, I want to – we're not going to have time to go through all 17. We only have like about another four minutes. So um, let's, let's look at a couple of them. For example, you kind of teased this already. The idea – we already talked about uh, the sexual dimorphism, but – Bad desires and behaviors seem to be built in. There is empirical, there's an empirical basis for original sin. Yeah. So I've been observing the way that um, evolutionary psychologists have been digging into the negative side of human nature. So we've often heard that a a non-Christian worldview is that people are imperfect or flawless, like a lot of Christian worldview kind of education talks about this. Um, the, there's, there's a kind of liberal moral worldview that has too, too high a view of human nature. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we, we've seen that come into conflict. People want to believe everyone's inherently good. Evolutionary psychologists will show that the instincts for war and violence are built in. Um, they're not perfectly eradicable. We, they, they can't just be gotten rid of. Um, and so I want us to appreciate, for example, that those psychologists and scientists are giving us insight into original sin. And when um, non-Christians start to, let's say they start reading those books or listening to podcasts about that, they're, they're already on the path to a Christian worldview, okay? They're not learning about Jesus Christ and redemption, but they are learning about um, the fallen nature of the world and our, our human minds and our desires. And so to me, that's, that's one starting point. They're, they're already part of the way down the path. And again, these are, these are starting points. We, we can use yeah. these to point people to the God who created and the God who saves. 
And mm-hmm. okay, another one of the things you pointed out in this list of 17 secular premises for theological arguments, by the way, if you want the article, uh, just text me at 877-933-2484. I'll get that off to you. Another one that I thought was interesting was the need for an ethic of love. And I don't know if you can explain this in like two minutes, but hopefully mm. you can. Yeah. So this, the, we need an ethic of love that counters, say, internet age hatred, I, yeah. I said, um, I see these these thinkers. I'd recommend them both. Alan de Botton, who who's got this whole philosophy school online, and Ayishat Akanbi. There, but uh, you can check out their video. But it's amazing. The point is, yeah. The, the point is the idea that um, we should love even our enemies. Like a lot of people reject this, and you know, Christian worldview isn't all about hitting the facts really hard. It's also the ethic of forgiveness. I mean, mm-hmm. there, are, there are people who don't believe we ought to forgive those who do wrong. There are people who don't believe we ought to give the benefit of the doubt. In that particular video, um, you know, Ayusha Akanbi is um, of African descent, and uh, someone in the audience asks her about racism and says, well, how can I love or forgive someone who's racist? Isn't that clearly pure evil? And Aisha says something very remarkable there, which is, I'm not going to uh, give you the power over me to make you think, uh, to make me think that you're evil. I'm not going to let you do that. I'm going to assume that you are a human and that you, your mind could be changed. And that um, even when you, you know, do something that's deeply wrong, that there's still a way to get through through to you. And I see that as a recognition of the image of God in people and of the need for something like Christ's teaching, that we should love even our enemies. And that could really transform, say, internet discourse, political discourse generally. Uh, so there are some non-Christians appreciating and believing that. Oh, that is, and that's amazing, too. Uh, we have just about a minute here, Joel, and I want to give you the opportunity because among the things you're doing, you have some very thought-provoking writings there at The Natural Theologian on a variety of topics, but you also you're starting to do, or actually been doing it for a while now, you have a course on theological epistemology. Now, it is behind a paywall, but I, I want you to t- tell people about that because it's important. It's uh, First off, what is epistemology? It's a big you know, $20 word. What does it mean? Yeah, well, epistemology is the study of knowledge. And so really, I'm, by theological epistemology, I'm just saying the study of knowledge as a, as a Christian, as, as mm-hmm. someone who believes in God and wants to see how these things relate. So one of my main goals, I have a theology degree, but now I'm studying uh, in a philosophy department with a non-Christian professor. And I want to understand how our, our Christian knowledge, say, through the Bible, relates to non-Christian knowledge through science, philosophy, common sense, and, and so on. And so in the course, I'm really, I'm talking about how those two things are related. It's, it's really summed up, my slogan for my, my Substack is uh, helping Christians learn from secular sources without fear. Mm-hmm. We know uh, that, you know, if, if you give a Christian a Bible verse, you know, we accept it and believe it. Uh, but I want us to get to the point where I can hand a Christian a book of evolutionary psychology and they can say, there's all sorts of things about God's created world and how he made our minds that I can appreciate and learn from this. In fact, I think this ultimately points beyond evolution to God himself. Mm -hmm. So again, if you're interested in taking the course or just reading Joel's articles, you can find him at joelcarini.substack.com or just search for The Natural Theologian. Joel, thanks again for spending time with us here on Mornings uh, Without Carmen. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> Blessings, man. Oh, again, uh, if you're one who's exploring, maybe you, as we've been talking, Joel and I talking, you, you've been exploring about God because you, you, you've been looking at the secular worldview and a lot of the stuff that's been out there and going, this is not working. And, and so you're listening to Faith Radio to try and learn more about the Christian, not just worldview, but about Jesus. Hey, we're glad you're here. Glad to help you. But don't do your exploring in isolation. We have some friends at the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association who would gladly help answer some of your questions and explain more about Jesus. So text the word FAITH to 41224, and for you, maybe you can start that conversation. Well, again, I'm Paul filling in for Carmen, Mornings with Carmen, or should I say without Carmen here on Faith Radio, and isolation. (laughs) Isolated. A lot of people feel that way today. It's happening far too often among Christians who don't engage with other believers on a regular basis in organic fellowship at a church. 
We are unfortunately reflecting a broader trend in our culture, by the way. People feel more isolated. Many do their interacting online in various ways, but often the culture silos, uh, but often in a culturally siloed way, only hearing from you, the voices you like and those you dislike or just differ from, you don't listen to. That can and has had profoundly negative impacts on our society as a whole, including the way we engage politically. Did Jesus call us to isolate? Daniel Bennett from the Uneasy Citizenship blog joins us in three minutes here on Faith Radio. Well, again, good morning. I'm Paul. Thanks for spending time with me as I fill in for Carmen. Mornings without Carmen today and tomorrow here on Faith Radio. And okay, Houston, we've got a problem. Even before the pandemic, but especially during and since, people have become increasingly isolated. And that isolation has led to many problems psychologically, relationally, socially. (laughs) Oh, Houston, we have another problem. And this is not just the U.S., but in many countries around the world, our societies have become increasingly polarized. Is there a connection between these two problems? Well, joining us now is Daniel Bennett, a political scientist at uh, John Brown University and also the author of the book, Uneasy Citizenship, Embracing the Tension of Faith and Politics, plus he hosts a blog on Substack by that same title, Uneasy Citizenship. Uh, Hey, Dan, good to have you back here on Faith Radio. Morning, Paul. Good morning. Okay. The twin problems of loneliness and polarization. Now, as a political scientist, you've been dealing with polarization for quite a bit, and you could easily, and if you can, just real quickly, talk about some of the dangerous logic of polarization. So polarization isn't bad in and of itself right in the sense that you know thinking about the ways our political parties have distinguished themselves from one another uh when it's essentially functioning at a party level polarization gives voters a choice a more stark choice when they go to cast their ballots during election season so without polarization voters who don't you know spend a lot of time researching candidates or party platforms wouldn't have a great idea of who they should be voting for when it comes to elections. So some polarization is good. The type of polarization we're seeing today, where people are separating themselves and not only sorting ourselves by party and policy, but rather considering the opposition as fundamentally dangerous or even evil, that kind of polarization is really, really dangerous for a political system that depends on consensus, compromise, and eventually, especially for people who lose the election, respecting the results of those elections. Mm -hmm. And I think we're on the road toward a very dangerous sort of polarization where we're just having less and less in common with people with whom we disagree. Yeah. Again, I I read something, I would think it was one of the articles you shared recently on your blog post about this, and we can share your article easily. Um, For those who are interested on our text line, just ask for it, 877-933-2484. As you just said, in healthy democracies... Opposite sides see each other as, yes, political adversaries to compete against and at times to negotiate with, but there's a give and take. But what happens when you talk about depolarization and both sides see the other as enemies that need to be vanquished? I mean, politics was – somebody once said politics was put in place to prevent war, and now we're using it as a weapon of war. Yeah, or at least as a weapon of a social uh, conflict that – prevents elected officials from doing the work that we're tasking them uh, to do. So voters, it's funny, in survey research, voters generally say they support compromise and elected officials working together. And that sounds great in practice. But when you give people examples to say, well, okay, consider your favored party, do you want them compromising on the issues that you support? And not surprisingly, the answer is no. <laughs> And so increasingly what compromise means is us getting everything we want and everybody else getting less and less of what they want. Well, that sounds great for us as, you know, if we're not doing the compromising. Mm-hmm. So the type of polarization that we're seeing today where whether or not it's driven from political elites and then filtering down to the mass public or it's bubbling up from the mass public up to our political elites, the system isn't really working in that respect as it was intended 
to work. Now we're still passing laws and the government's still generally functioning, but the incentives for our elected officials are different. How we're evaluating these elected officials are different. And it's leading to some pretty uh, dangerous or, or at least frustrating outcomes mm-hmm. in the political scene. Okay, so that's the polarization problem. But in your article, you talk about also the isolation, the loneliness issue. These these are twin problems. How does the loneliness factor into our polarization? Well, I mean, the the, the article that I referenced in, in my article uh, references a book from the 1990s, a very famous book in social science, Bowling Alone by Robert Putnam. And he's arguing that over the last several decades in American society, we've seen a decline of what he, he calls social capital, hmm. which is essentially the ties that bind communities and individuals together. And, you know, since the book was published about 30 years ago, we've seen an even steeper decline in social capital as people are joining fewer and fewer civic organizations. People are not attending church as often as they used to. Now, they might feel connected from their uh, web presence, social media platforms, et cetera. But these are pretty thin forms of social capital. And so it leads to this sort of feeling isolated or alienated, at least from the communities in which we live in proximity Mm -hmm. to one another. It might feel like we're connected, but the actual connections are much thinner than they than they used to be with with neighbors or, or townspeople, for example. And I do think there's a relationship between isolation and alienation and a greater polarization as we meet fewer and fewer people who think differently from we do in day-to-day life, it's easier to form character caricatures of those with whom we disagree and have those, I guess, fearful or negative impressions drive our views of one another. So, okay, getting back to the polarization issue, because you have those who you're in your silo and it, it favors the extreme voices in the silo to drive what's happening in your silo. And that, again, as you're getting out into the world, it just makes everybody else seem scarier. I mean, consider if you, you know, let's say you generally vote for Democrats. Uh, You're not particularly political, but your your family has voted for Democrats for, for generations, and that's just what you've grown up with. If you know Republicans in your community, And you really get a chance to know them if they're your neighbors. You get to know what they're concerned about. You get to know the issues that are prompting their votes. Now, you might not necessarily agree with them and you think they might be wrong, but you're unlikely to view them as evil, right? Mm -hmm. It's your neighbor. It's the person that your, your kids go to school with. But if all your impressions of people with whom you disagree politically are coming from social media and these 30 second video clips of the most extreme voices from either side of the political spectrum, your perception of reality of political ideology is going to be so warped to those extremes that you start to even subconsciously group anyone with whom you disagree into that extreme category. When in all likelihood, your neighbor who shares different political beliefs than you or has different political beliefs than you is going to be very much like you in almost every other way. Mm -hmm. But we just don't see it like that anymore. One of the ways you close out that portion of your your post, you talk about for Christians, serious about shoring up the cultural ruins to, you know, bring healing. The most important thing we can do is to be more relational, driven by concern not for me, but for we. And I think... That's where we want to take this conversation uh, in just a few moments here as we continue, continue as we continue talking with uh, Daniel Bennett. The coffee's going to work sooner or later, Daniel, I tell you. <laughs> but uh, we want to talk about being the importance as us as us as Christians of being good. And I know we don't like the word exiles here in the world. So we're going to talk about that in just a few moments here on Mornings Without Carmen on Faith Radio. Just take the first step. Just take the first step. I mean, every journey begins with a first step, right? And if you want to hike to the top of a mountain or if you just want to, well, make it around the block, it all starts with a first step. Just take one step, a step out the door. Now, the same holds true in the journey of discipleship with Jesus. A relationship with Jesus actually begins with a first step. Sometimes taking that first step can be really hard, right? 
Well, if you've got questions about what it means to begin a relationship with Jesus, just take the first step. Text the word FAITH to 41224. Our friends at the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association are going to hold your hand as you take the first step or the next step in your walk of faith with Jesus. They're going to help you walk with him and talk with him. Take the first step of faith today. Text the word FAITH to 41224. Well, again, a good Monday morning. Mornings without Carmen again here on Faith Radio as she's taking time off to be with her folks. I'm Paul filling in. And, okay, the Bible gives us a lot of images for what we're to be in this world. One of them is ambassador. Carmen talks about that a lot. Another one is exile. And I know that doesn't sound like, you know, to be an exile. It doesn't sound like to be a wonderful thing, but in our case, it can be. Uh, We're talking again with uh, Daniel Bennett, political scientist from John Brown University, as well as the author of his uh, book, Uneasy Citizenship, and the blog he has by that same name, which you can find this article we're going to talk about, The Important Words, uh, Work of a People in Exile. I think that's, was that about it? Yeah, The Important Words for a People in in Exile. Important words. Uh, Again, the coffee's going to kick in sooner or later, Daniel. (laughs) So, but anyway... (laughs) The idea of being in exile, I mean, you know, you look at somebody who's a refugee and it just doesn't look like a pretty picture. And yet, and, and, and it, it, in many respects, we get the word from, and we've talked about the passage in Jeremiah 29, but it's, it's, it's supposed to be God's giving us an opportunity to do something beautiful. So let's talk about that. Talk about being in exile. Well, I mean, if you go to Jeremiah 29, the context there, of course, is God's people have been taken from their land and sent to this foreign environment. And and this wasn't a choice they had. This was something that they were taken from. And you would imagine the the feelings of the people who were faithful and trying to get a sense for why God would allow this to happen. And, you know, how is he going to fight for us and how should we fight for our, you know, freedoms if they're characterizing it in that particular way? And you know, the prophet's instructions aren't to resist their captors or reject certain elements of their culture and only or preserve a revolt and, and rise up and try to try to take back, you know, by force. But the prophet tells them, you know, the Lord is asking them to essentially build homes and, and maintain gardens and see and very importantly, seek the welfare of the city into which, you know, they have been sent. And this isn't because God is trying to, to dilute the culture of his people or to try to downplay the differences between his chosen people and, and, and the pagans. Um, but because there's an opportunity for, to, to, to highlight and to showcase God's uh, sovereignty mm-hmm. and the ability to take something horrible and make it good. And so for us, you know, when we look at a changing culture and we're talking specifically maybe just in the United States, we acknowledge that we are not, you know, collectively as Christians in the same cultural position that we were, say, 50 years ago. And that can be frustrating for some. It can be discouraging and and we can lament a change of things. But we look to scripture, especially in Jeremiah, and say, well, what kind of opportunities might we have living in this environment to act from an exilic posture here to say, we're not going to dominate or to lead, but rather to highlight God's uh, the certain characteristics, characteristics of God in a way that we haven't been able to do in our culturally dominant position. And so in some sense, it's frustrating to be in a minority, right. Or mm-hmm. to be a people in exile, but it's also a really, I think, freeing opportunity for us to just live and to showcase who God is in those moments. Now, you mentioned something just a moment ago because the 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 reason that people were taken into exile was for that very pur- purpose, to dilute them, to basically wipe their culture out while not, you know, it, it, that's the intent yeah. usually. That's what the Assyrians did. That's what the Babylonians did. Assimilation. Assimilation, right. But what God, Jeremiah, uh, what, God, what God through Jeremiah was asking, okay, be a good exile in that, number one, first be faithful to me, to the community of, of, of uh, the nation of Israel, even in exile, but be faithful to that. But then 
go and be a positive, be the shining light yeah. and then be a positive influence. Right. Yeah. And so we can take instruction there to say we don't have to and we shouldn't uh, take on all the markers of our changing culture or hop on whatever is popular in our culture today and, and just latch on to those values. But there are ways, and I'm not saying it's easy, but th there are ways that we can discern and prayerfully consider how to be faithful in our witness as exiles in this culture to say, we're going to seek the flourishing and welfare and good of our communities. We're going to do so in love for our neighbors. We're going to do so using the work and the tools and the skills that we've been given, the talents that we've been endowed with. And we can contribute to this broader community, as well as the communities individually in which we live, to seek the prospering of those uh, communities around us. Mm -hmm. And that's going to look different for different kinds of people. If you're a teacher, if you're an engineer, if you're a nurse, if you're a parent, if you are a child, it's all going to be different depending on your 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 uh, place in, in our society. Mm -hmm. But there are always opportunities for the people of God to shape the people around them in ways that we might not necessarily consider at first. Exactly. And a lot of people, we were just talking off air about, okay, we're called to, again, be faithful to ourselves and be this positive influence. And this requires us to, you know, not only just walk and chew gum, but also at the same time to juggle three balls in the air while standing on one foot. And, and it almost seems, you know, as one person's looking at that going, I, 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 I can't do all that, but you're not alone. I mean, again, to be a faithful exile community, you, you just brought it out. Okay, say you're in the medical field. Be a light in the medical field. Wherever you, God has put you, right? Yeah, exactly. And to, to tie it back uh, to our conversation from, from the first segment, this is why community, especially for believers, is so important. This is why being involved and attending and contributing to a local church body that is you know, made up of, of people from, from around the community, from different walks of life and different skill sets and different levels of education and different races and, 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 and socioeconomic statuses. And essentially we draw from and lift each other up and we support one another, we encourage one another, and ultimately we equip one another in our respective lives. And I, by doing that, we're not asked to take on the burden of being this ambassador to a culture uh, in which we're exiled, but we do this together. Mm -hmm. And then we regroup at least once a week together and encourage <laughs> exactly. and worship. And, and that's how we find our strength and support for one another mm -hmm. is through our church communities, among other things. Yeah. So it's almost like, uh, okay, we head back to the embassy <laughs> every week. And, yeah, exactly right. So, hey, what did you do? What'd y'all do this week? Yeah, there you go. There you go. Hey, uh, Daniel, thanks again for joining us again. Connect with Daniel on his blog at Substack. Just do danielbennett.substack.com or just look for uh, uneasy citizenship. And again, Daniel, thanks for joining us here on Faith Radio. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, it's great having you. Well, again, mornings without Carmen. I'm Paul. And hey, what are you thankful for today? Maybe something in the sports news. If you're a listener in New York, maybe you're celebrating uh, the Liberty defeating Minnesota Lynx in, in Game 5 of the WNBA championship. So it's the New York Liberty, the WNBA champions. But then again, you also, maybe you're not a, a women's basketball fan. Baseball, I mean, the Yankees will be facing off against the L.A. Dodgers uh, this week in the World Series. Now, this is, this is one of the historic matchups in baseball. Uh, these two teams, both with roots in New York, remember the Dodgers up till 1958, where the Brooklyn Dodgers, well, they've been, they're going to face off again. This is the, I think they've already faced off 11 times since the 1940s, the most recent time in 1981. Or maybe you're thankful for apples. After all, it's National Apple Day, great time in, this, in the fall. So what are you thankful for this morning? Seriously, I want to know. Text me at 877-933-2484. Yeah, apples. A good honey crisp with uh, cut up in slices and then you dip it in the caramel sauce. Oh, so or or sweet tango. That's a really good apple too. Anyway, more mornings with Carmen on the way here on Faith Radio. 
Thanks for listening to Mornings with Carmen LaBurge. Podcasts like this are available because of your support. If it's important to you to hear things that encourage your faith, click the link in the show notes to give now. And thanks.